I saw this as a great opportunity. Uh, anybody here just come back from New Orleans from the APA conference? Okay. Um, a lot of discussions there about resiliency, about sea level rise, coastal flooding, and about communication. And so one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is not so much the full story of the Weather Together initiative, if you went to Keeping History Above Water, or any of the Weather Together activities we've had in the past few years. Zoe was there at the very beginning, for example. Uh, you've heard some of this, but I do want to talk about the public engagement. And I'm also going to be pulling on some key um, lessons learned uh, from other organizations. Uh, some of you may have heard of Eco America. Uh, they have like the 12 uh, ways to communicate science effectively when you're dealing with resilience planning. Um, Something that uh, we heard uh, first thing this morning um, in regards to not a doom and gloom scenario, but there is hope. And so that's what I basically focus on in all of the community engagement. This is an individual action. Just because you're not a director of planning or a head of emergency management doesn't mean that you can't start something. Uh, I think the fact of the matter is just by the fact that you're all here today, it means you're educating yourselves on this issue and you can become the nucleus around which an entire community can begin a planning effort. So have hope, take some accountability, and take some action. And that's what I'm going to talk about, how you can kind of do that. I also, um, <clears throat> Helen mentioned keeping history above water in Annapolis. Keeping history above water, St. Augustine. So for those of you who love historic coastal communities, uh, May 5th through 8th, 2019, okay? So we are well ahead of the curve, and uh, if you're looking for something to do in May, not hurricane season, um, <laughs> you can travel on down to St. Augustine. There's some flyers out on the table. Um, so weather together. Uh, how we go about community, uh, community engagement and communicating the message of resilience and adaptation, because that is what I'm gonna talk about adaptation. We aren't looking at mitigation efforts. We want to adapt our historic community. Uh, yes, one of the big questions or comments made at the APA conference was, well, why aren't we just jumping straight to managed retreat? And that's just not reasonable. Our communities don't, they need to start the dialogue. We need to kind of get them comfortable with understanding their options as a community and plan towards that. Uh, but it is part of the mix. So eight lessons learned, eight steps to community engagement that we experienced in Annapolis. Create partnerships, market the brand, empower your local officials and others, invite experts, state the facts, and also tell a story with those facts. Promote solutions, make friends with the media, and communicate the consensus. So I'm gonna go through a number of these and just pick out a couple of key lessons learned under each of these criteria. We had a number of partnerships. This is not all inclusive, but it was some of our major partnerships. The important thing to understand about creating partnerships is when somebody says, I hear you're having this meeting, and maybe you should invite the Army Corps of Engineers to come. You say yes, yes to everybody. Yes to service providers, companies, product suppliers. I don't care if they want to come and market their product or their service. Give them an opportunity to talk to the people that they know will listen to what it is they have to say. Sometimes we didn't have them come back again, or they did what they wanted to do. But you know, we learned. We learned a lot about the tools, products, services, um, studies that are out there. So we always said yes. Some of those yeses turned into money. And that's the other thing. When you have people come to the table, sometimes they can give you in-kind services, the Army Corps over three different summers, provided $120,000 of in-kind assistance without any contracts. They did our flood elevation studies. They worked with both the Naval Academy and us looking at adaptation strategies for the Annapolis shoreline. And then they did elevation studies uh, over in the Eastport community. So we said yes a lot. Um, and this is the product that came out of the Army Corps of Engineers. And it's something we couldn't have really afforded to do on our, cell, on our own. And frankly, we didn't know we needed until the Corps said, here's what 
you'll find out if you do this assessment of your historic properties. So we have elevation studies. Now every property owner that lives in the flood risk area actually knows what their adjacent grade elevation is, where they're going to be flooding. Um, and this is an important document for everyone to be able to uh, provide to residents as part of community engagement. The Union of Concerned Scientists. Yes, scientists are extremely important. And again, I learned about this study from someone who came to one of our meetings. Actually, it was the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Said so the Union of Concerned Scientists had contacted them. So this publication, National Landmarks at Risk, has a lot of National Park Service sites, other federally owned sites, but it's got a couple of communities. They showcased Annapolis and why we were at risk because of the 925% increase in tidal flooding. Galveston. So there were a couple of communities that they focused on as well. And then other partnerships. Of course, with a historic city like Annapolis, you need to have all of your historic preservation partners at the table with you first. So we, we involved Historic Annapolis, our local preservation group. Uh, we involved the, the Maryland Historical Trust, clearly another grant funder, but this was an important issue because while the Maryland Department of Planning may have had some dismantling. The Climate Action Plan is still in place. And so we were very happy to be involved with uh, the Maryland Historical Trust, as well as so many members of the um, advisory group, the Adaptation and Resilience Working Group, I think it is. So there are a lot of informed people that are working hard to promote the state's Climate Action Plan. And in the Climate Action Plan, if you have not read it, you need to read it because it says that the state government will assist and enable local communities. And the only way they can do that is if you have participating local communities. So I would encourage you to take that to heart. And of the four primary actions in the Adaptation Working Group, uh, we're focusing on building resilience. That's our part of the Climate Action Plan. And we were recognized by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, as well as the Maryland Historical Trust for our efforts at outreach. And we used existing um, promotional and marketing efforts. This Place Matters is an initiative of the National Trust, began five, six years ago. We just made sure that people understood This Place Matters as it relates to the area of risk in Annapolis and uh, gathered information about what places did matter. The Urban Land Institute Baltimore chapter provided us $10,000 for our community engagement activity. Spend it any way you want to. We spent it on a planning charrette and we partnered uh, with ULI as well as the National League of Cities. The National League of Cities called us and said, we see you guys are doing some interesting work on sustainability and resilience. Would you be interested in being part of this sustainability initiative we're kicking off? You betcha. So $10,000 from them. Again, focused exclusively on community engagement outreach activities uh, uh, for the uh, Keeping History Above Water Conference. It also gave us the opportunity to get technical assistance from them. I was on a monthly phone call. We had uh, the National Institutes of Science and Technology on the call. We had um, the, um, oh, uh, excuse me, the, um, Thriving Earth Exchange, if any of you know about them, through AGU, one of the largest uh, assistance nonprofit organizations that helps on issues of sustainability. Um, so you, again, get partnerships and technical assistance you wouldn't know about. Inviting the experts, um, we've had wonderful information from our experts. We need those experts to translate the science to our community at a level they can understand. And so we had brought John Englander in, um, who does a wonderful job of, I think he had maybe one or two graphs and charts. The rest of it was really about, here's the story, here's what you need to know, you can plan. And I think that that was kind of the motivating factor with John. We had almost 600 people fill St. John's College to hear about the science of climate change and what it meant to us in our community. He brought it down to the ground, to our community. But we also have our local experts. The US Naval Academy, we couldn't be more blessed. I mean, you know, we've got our own scientists right next door. And they, as, as Zoe told you, they have in their mission statement to work with the city of Annapolis and the state. So again, take advantage of who's in your own backyard. Um, and uh, obviously, we've got UMCs here that are wonderful um, leaders in this issue. 
other experts. Um, we had the National Flood Insurance Program folks. If you call them and say, I'd like you to come and do a presentation in my community, why does flood insurance matter? What do I need to know about it? We scheduled those meetings at two separate times. One in the evening, so that residents, when they came home after work, could come to that particular meeting. The next one in the morning for business owners so that they could make it into their businesses by 9.30 or so. So you kind of have to schedule your audiences and make sure when you're talking to the individuals they know this is a commercially based business owner audience, this is a residential audience. Um, the biggest thing I learned out of the NFIP workshops, everybody in this room should have flood insurance. Everybody. I pay $428 a year for flood insurance because if there's an extreme precipitation event or if there's a water main break and it crosses one property line onto your property, the NFIP has you covered. It doesn't have to be anything to do with sea level rise or extreme precipitation events. Um, the other important thing was to have key people that attended. So not only did we have uh, planning staff from both the local and state offices there, as well as um, uh, federal agencies participating in our planning uh, charrette. Uh, the National Park Service came. Um, we also had some local experts that had dealt with these issues that were part of our, our planning team. So Eileen Fogarty, who was previously with City of Annapolis, had worked with two other California communities on planning for and recovering from major disaster events. So this was useful for us to have in the sense of planning a, a resilience plan. And then again, all of this information sharing needs to be done with your elected officials there. Um, the flood risk area was Alder, the alderman from Ward 1 was obviously uh, very keenly interested. But over in Ward 8, over in the Eastport community, um, Ross Arnett would come to these meetings as well. And then we would have at some of our bigger community meetings the chair of the Public Safety Committee, uh, as well as some older people who uh, had um, residents of their wards working downtown. Because remember, it's a very affluent downtown, but 60% of the properties are commercial. And the people that work there depend on those jobs for their livelihood. The reality is, is if you're closing down 40 days out of the year and that individual server or retail staff person can't get into work, let alone work because the business isn't open, then they're losing money that day. So we have to keep that all in mind. Um, I would say too that many of our um, uh, older people actually joined us up in Newport to share with the Newport community some of their experiences um, in terms of uh, working on resilience and planning in Annapolis. Market the brand. We did learn you really have to have a catchy uh, uh, title for your project. We ended up putting together a cultural resource hazard mitigation plan. Okay, that's not really catchy. So uh, whether together, protecting our historic seaport was our brand. We had a local Main Street business that donated her time and her staff's time to help us come up with the brand, to develop the design. And we share this with everybody. If anybody <clears throat> wanted to use this, the state actually used it for a workshop that they did. You know, it's just basically your historic Sanborn map with that stamp. You could have it be any coastal community in America. And our point was to save other people the money and time that went into it. Um, saying the facts and telling the story, you've all already heard the facts. It's been published numerous times, so there was no doubt that we had the facts we needed. But telling the story ended up, um, it was interesting to me. We would get a lot of phone calls from the media, from others. The State Department called us twice. So that photo on the right is a film crew uh, from Ecuador who came because they wanted, they visited eight communities in the United States and they wanted to see what we were doing. They wanted to understand what the issue was. So we had actually two State Department visits to learn more about what Annapolis was doing. And I think that's part of our responsibility is to share our lessons learned worldwide. This is a global issue. This is not an Annapolis issue or a Chesapeake Bay issue or an East Coast issue. This is a worldwide issue. But when it comes home, we obviously have heard the facts about what's going on in the Chesapeake. And I'll, I'll tell this last story at the very end, but you know, this is the same house right there, 
right there. So the reality is this hits home to those of us in particular who work with older and historic communities. We are losing landmarks uh, and that's important to us to address. We already know what happened after Isabel. Don't ever do this, never walk in this. One of the things I will say is that we had a, a um, about every other month, we had a meeting with another expert. So we had the Department of Public Health that came in and talked about health concerns relative to climate change and sea level rise. We also had um, ServPro, who ended up being a sponsor for our conference, who came in and talked about biohazards and the fact that you cannot be out there walking in that muck. So if nothing else, buy flood insurance and don't walk in the muck. <laughs> And as I said, we found a tool, okay? There's plenty of planning documents out there. And Zoe said it, it's absolutely right. Integration, integration, integration. All your plans should reflect and respond to other planning documents by reference, if not wholly integrating some of their goals and objectives. So we started with uh, FEMA's guidance for integrating historic properties into hazard mitigation planning because our hazard mitigation plan was being updated. And so we got funding from FEMA to update the plan, we got $106,000. We wouldn't have gotten it if we didn't have Mark James, who uh, was at that time in MEMA, um, handling the state hazard mitigation officer. He came to almost all of our meetings and he said, okay, you're ready now apply for the grant now. And he just wanted to see our commitment. It was a year into the work. We applied for the grant. We got full funding for the grant to update the plan to incorporate a cultural resource hazard mitigation plan into it. So we pretty much followed the FEMA four-step process. And it's not unlike any other plan. You know, some of the stuff that we saw earlier today. Um, and what I usually talk about is I go around to different groups and talk about how we did this process. So if anybody's interested in learning more about how we did that process, um, I believe it's my responsibility to share that information with you if you're interested. And I've got cards up here and you can come talk to me. We mapped, I think this is like one of the few maps I have in this presentation. We mapped our flood risk area, which we picked at a 10 foot elevation line because it was easy for our GIS person to pull up a 10 foot line. So it's like 8.2 feet with our 1% chance plus 3.7 sea level rise. And we went up to 10 feet instead because there's storm surge and you know, we could have gone up to the state house, but we didn't. We picked a, we thought it was a conservative line, and there were 147 properties within that boundary area. The other important thing is we decided to use GIS-based mapping since we have a great GIS person, Sean Wampler, and I hope we never lose her because uh, the city of Annapolis benefits <laughs> greatly from her. Um, she worked with uh, my current firm, Michael Baker, who also came forward and said, well, you guys are doing this really interesting stuff and we wanna practice on you. We have an innovation lab and we wanna create a story map that basically takes our 208 page cultural resource hazard mitigation plan and puts it into a story map form so people can follow it. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with story maps, great learning tool, a very good opportunity to engage the public. So, <clears throat> This is the landmark at risk story map. You can see there's a series of tabs, our strategic approach, the weather together initiative, uh, adapting your landmark ways you can do that, how you can get involved. We had people load pictures from the conference. Um, you can put anything you want up there. We had, we'd put information about registering for the conference, uh, the hazard mitigation plan can go up there, who to contact. And then because we had a big history above water event, before um, I left, we had that tab up there. And you just keep tabbing, and you go through a whole GIS-based uh, approach to knowing what the resource is, getting photos of it, up-to-date um, uh, information that's available. So hopefully this will be something that the city will continue to maintain over time. It's a great way to demonstrate it. And then promoting the solutions. And these are the things that are in the FEMA guidance. I'm not gonna show you all of the things. We ended up with 48 action items, five goals, and that's a whole nother presentation. But it's important to remember that there are a lot of land use tools and uh, performance standards that are already identified as ways that you can address these issues of uh, climate change flooding in your communities. 
we wanted to start with individual property owners because there, it's going to cost a lot of money even to do the, the um, flood management system in, in downtown. But in the meantime, what can an individual property owner do to make their property more resilient, uh, to minimize harm, um, if not completely eliminate harm? So we ended up putting some solutions in there. And we also felt it was our responsibility to share this information with others. The state of Maryland specifically funded our survey work because they were looking for a model document they could give to other historic communities. And so we did do very early on a technical assistance visit to Crisfield um, to talk with them about what tools they needed. They didn't have a lot of technical people. Gave them some advice, uh, for example, on um, putting together a grant. <coughs> And then again, make friends with the media. We got a lot of media coverage, and I felt as um, that our local media really did take the time to learn about the issues. It, there were very few inaccuracies in their reporting, but we also had NPR that came on a number of occasions and did some pieces, um, as well as um, a number of the major research institutions who had their own online publications. And then lastly, you need to communicate the consensus. What did the community say? What did they say from the planning charrette? What did they say? We had about 400 people that did the online survey. What were their comments? Why did this place matter to them? What were they looking at to create a more resilient community? And with us, it was really this idea of adapt or else. <clears throat> There's a lot of great public art out there. And I think that public art has a very strong message to send. And this is a series of installations. If I had not gone to the Newport conference, I wouldn't have learned about this. But this is a series of installations um, that this particular artist, artist has um, erected in France and other locations that shows if you're sitting around talking about this issue, it will overwhelm you. <clears throat> and I think that's why we need to focus on what's going on at the local, state, and regional level right now, because we're not looking for leadership from our federal government right now but we know we can get things done locally. So I'm gonna show this last image. Um, many of you are familiar with Holland Island. Um, I wanna talk a little bit why this all matters. The issue really becomes one of documenting what's important to our communities, our heritage, doing what we can to minimize the harm and damage, managing retreat, managing it, because eventually some of these places will be gone. And lastly, interpreting, interpreting that whole period of development. So this is Holland Island in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, the area was settled uh, around the 1600s. It was a fishing and farming community by the 1850s. Uh, at its peak, it had 360 residents, 70 buildings, and 90 boats. This is uh, one of those buildings, pretty typical vernacular uh, farmhouse from uh, that period for Holland Island. This is how it looked uh, in, 19, in the 1950s, actually. Um, by that time, <clears throat> there had been noticeable shoreline erosion in the early part of the century. Uh, after one big tropical storm in 1918, most families left. However, it did have a strong fishing season still. They would come back for that. Um, there was a gentleman who attempted to save this same house, it's always that house that seems to be in the pictures, uh, in 1995 when that's what really was left. Uh, and you can see he's got, you know, the equipment out there to create more um, uh, uh, land area around the house. But in 2003 it was devastated by Isabel and um, with so much of the land lost and gone, we were down to that structure. And that was the last uh, documented photograph that I could find other than the little peak you saw earlier. So this one kind of just teaches me that we really need to do what I'd said. We need to document now. You can afford to document things. Make sure you document what's important and ask your community what's important. And then just start the planning process. It took us four years. It's okay. We have time to plan, but we have to start now. So thank you very much. Yes. When you went to the community you talked to, Chris Field and another, were they, when you went there, what came of it? Was there acceptance? 
when I went to, when we went to the other communities. So Crisfield, we were brought in by um, an individual who was part of the faith community. And they didn't have a lot of economic development. I mean, they were, a whole, they, they were missing everything. They had a part-time building inspector. That was about it. They had nobody in planning. What they did know they needed was a technical assistance team. Okay, so they went ahead and applied for a grant for a technical assistance team, but they were turned down. So sometimes it doesn't go anywhere, but the fact was they learned a lot about the process and they communicated with each other and they were already starting to actually adapt some of the buildings. And one of the things we pointed out was elevating buildings actually did work there because they were single family homes. And so we encouraged them to work with MHT and to approach the 100% uh, mitigation standard from FEMA because they had had a history of flooding and a history of raising individual buildings. They didn't have, like Annapolis, a lot of row houses. They were a lot of single family houses. So.